Good morning! Bradley McAllister Spirocraft. February 21, I believe it is. I think it's the 21st, something like that. I'm back in the studio. Had to take the week off last week. Um, back out here, totally organized as always. Uh, good morning, Joe. Good morning, Art. Good to see you guys. Um, I always, I don't come out here to the last minute. I don't know, one of these days I'll learn or not. Um, but it doesn't matter. Uh, we're here to have fun. We're here to make a goblet and enjoy the Monday spring. It is springtime out here. I mean, it's nice. I actually, heck, I got the air on. Been running the heat, now I got the air on. Uh, so let's see what's going on on my screens. Looks like I might want to adjust my chat screen over there for myself. Um, other, and I'm going to fix my Facebook feed, but I think everything's looking good. If, if it doesn't look good or sound good, let me know. I'm going to run into control room here real quick and make a couple of quick adjustments to my world from inside here. Real quick like. So that I can see that as a monitor there. And I can hide that little bar for myself there. And that looks good. That shows me what's going on over in that world. All right, I think, I think I got her. I think I've got her set. Looks like the lathe has got a whole lot of shimmer to it today. Uh, in the in the key, I see down here uh, on this side. Chroma key, fun stuff, right? Okay, so what do we got today? A piece of maple. I went out to. My little store storeroom over there and found this piece of maple it says maple on it so i'm going to assume that i knew what i was writing when i wrote it um, it's a good looking piece of wood it's not too bad it's got a little bit of wane you know on the side let's see let's go into the overhead there so this will be perfect for a small goblet cup uh, with a base it I, I say it's ambrosia it sure looks like there is some ambrosia coloring in here the beetle holes are definitely there uh, this thing is dry, God knows, six, eight years, maybe more. Uh, the, since this was cut, it was sealed on the ends and been left otherwise. Um, so my, my plan, uh, my goal was to make a really long stem goblet. And so, but I have, a, I have a confession to make, is that the one live center that I was looking for last time I was out here, I still haven't been able to lay hands on, and, and I don't know what I did with it. Um, and it's a threaded one, and I was going to do a certain thing, and I'll tell you about it more, but um, frustrating on my own. But we will make it as long, because uh, it's going to be unsupported, uh, unless I use a rubber chucky. But it's different, and I'll get into that in, in a bit. Um, what, so I've got a, a step drive in here. And just my live center down here. And we're going to mount this guy up between centers. There's some center marks on this from before. I don't know why. But we're going to go with them and see what we have. I don't know what the real center is. So I'm not going to get like super committed until I kind of take a look at this. Tighten that up just a, a smidgen. And let's see. On the end camera. So right now on the end camera... Um, you can't see the very end, but once this goes into the chuck, uh, once I get the turn and make a tendon on here that drops back in the chuck, you should be able to see the end here pretty good. So that's, uh, that's my plan there. I, you know, I don't intend for this to be large in diameter at all. Something's not tight. Let's see here. And it's the holiday, it's President's Day. The rest of the world is off. I guess. Well, actually, that's not true. Just the banks and, and government agencies. All right, so that's, you know, that's fairly snug in there. Let's take, give a little speed to this. And kind of get a feel for what we've got here. And I can see that I did not set the manual focus on the 
end camera it doesn't look like so hang on a sec let me check that real quick it should be in that mode but hey you never know yeah, it's on auto the PTZ cameras are coming soon gonna order this week finally finally get rid of this kind of craziness all right, let's try that again. See how I'm looking in the in the monitor and the focus of things. Well, that's crazy. Something it must have thrown a bug. Check this out. This is too crazy. So when I turned it back on just now, that got thrown to the camera lens up top. The only thing I can think is it threw one of the bugs out and up onto the lens of the camera. How crazy is that? Hey, my mom's in here. Good morning, mom. So that is just bizarre. But it had to be a bug that came out of there. I bet that was quite the ride going up to Nowhereville. So what I'm going to do is pop it on the end camera here and get my stool out. I guess I'm going to go up here and clean that camera lens. So that just tells you that the old bugs, they live in there for a long time. And don't go away but what a bother let's see what it's going to take to get this lens clean i'm glad i wasn't too far along in the process that is crazy Get it out of this camera just went crazy on me. Maybe the camera went crazy on me. Because it doesn't seem to be wiping. It's like it's on the inside of the lens. What is the deal? It just popped up out of nowhere. I'm going to turn this camera off, reboot. We may not have an overhead camera. Maybe, I, maybe it got really mad when I said I was ordering up the PTZ cameras. Well, there it came back. Uh, maybe it got mad when it heard that I was going to replace it. Because this is one of the ones that's going to get replaced. And we're going to shift that over there just a touch more. All right. That's bizarre. I've never seen that. I have no idea what that was. Because now it's clear again. Go figure. See that? Now it's back to normal. So it wasn't on the lens, it was something inside. That kind of tells me that maybe the electronics are trying to die. I still think it was listening. Maybe it's a Google camera and it listens to what I say. Anyway, okay. So hopefully that doesn't happen again. Um, that was, I mean, that was just totally bizarre. Yeah, isn't that weird, Bob? I have no idea. I can't complain. I've had these cameras for years and years and years out on the road with the woodworking show. Uh, I, I got my money out of them 10 times over. So I, I really just get through one more. Maybe the new camera will be in by next week. All right, enough of that. So we need to rough this down to round. Going to use a Carter and Son uh, roughing gouge, just and I'm just going to get it into the neighborhood. Now I was going to do this ahead of time so I didn't have to bore you with it, uh, but of course I was doing something else, like looking for my step drive or not my step drive, but my live center that I can't find. So we'll bop this thing down to Roy. Hey, Roy! Roy's popping in. Had my knee replaced in a. I'm back in business, well, I'm glad to hear that. Ceylon, good morning. Glad everybody's popping in. Um, so let's get in here, see what this piece of wood looks like. We're gonna make sure again that everything's locked down. I saw a video on the internet, um, just thinking about this, over the weekend. Um, it was a gal somewhere, and that's not relevant that it was a woman or a man, but had a, a big piece of wood, big, big, big piece of wood, like 80 pound chunk on a, on a big Powermatic or something. And they just had it between, she had it between centers like this. 
And when she turned the thing on, and it, I mean, it made about four revolutions, and she was standing right here, and then the whole thing came off. Dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. Got to be careful. That was crazy. So, and see, this is still kind of settling in here. And I'm going to make sure that this is as solid as I can get it. Okay. All right. Let's find the face mask that one can wear. Hey, clean it up for me. Good deal. Yeah, I might clean it again after the fact. And another thing, you may notice um, I'm not wearing the headset these days. All right, or at least right now. Uh, the mic I've got is just right, right here. Let me know uh, if you hear chips banging on it or not. Um, yeah, buffering, I don't see it. It might be on your end there, Art. Um, let me know if you hear chips hitting it or not, because this is the one that doesn't have the scratchiness in the wires, and I haven't changed the headset over. And also, I'm kind of curious if the audio stays uh, stays clear or clearer when I even when I put the face mask on. Okay, all right. So I, I did see a little buffer there for a second, Art, um, popping up. Looking at the keyframes, everything looks good. So who knows what the deal is? Probably Facebook. Probably Facebook. You should watch on YouTube. Uh, it, it's a better feed. Okay, let's go into overhead. Get this tool rest up here a bit more. There we go. Take her up to about a thousand RPMs. Hopefully that stays somewhat in focus for you. It's kind of a big piece of wood, so it's going to take me a couple of trips here. Hey, that's something that was weird. Hang on a second. Tool shaft is loose in the tool handle. Can't have that. That was weird. It's, gosh, it must be Monday, huh? All right, here we go. And I'm going to kind of go back and forth on this as we work our way down. I like to get the big square corners off first. Anything that might go flying at me. Is this, you know, it's, I mean, it's a square piece of wood. Square and not uniform. Now you notice I'm only going one direction because I don't like to throw the chips over to the left. It just has to do with what's in here in the room and all. A little more speed now as we're coming along. Raise that two rest up a little bit more, I think. It's going to be a really pretty piece of wood. It's got lots of holes in it. If you like worm character, that's a great thing. Got a nice smell to it. It's also dusty because it is, like I said, quite dry. Oh, 
it's a pretty piece of wood. Really pretty piece of wood. All right, I'm gonna pop down here, take these corners off. So what I really wanted to do, and I just checked that and it was starting to get a little loose there um, as the drives keep going in. I really wanted to um, leave it this long and have that whole long stem and up here use a uh, live center with the threads on it and put a, a cone and I just can't find it. I learned this from Stuart Batty. It's not something I came up with. Once we have a cup on here, we put a cone in the end and uh, tape it to our cup and pull it in tension and pull it back. Instead of pushing on the piece, we would pull back. But again, I can't find my other threaded center right now, so that's not really an option. Okay, let's go ahead and get this all the way down to round up here. This thing is full of bug holes. I like that. I like bug holes in my stuff. Again, I'm going to double check that because it was working up loose. There we go. And it doesn't need to be perfect because we're going to turn all that away. So I'm not going to worry about like making the perfect spindle. Okay. So I'm being real careful down here. Because I don't want to put this nice tool right into uh, the, the uh, chuck jaws. So I, I'm going to switch over now. Because I, I do not have a bias on what tool I use. So I'm switching over to uh, Easy Wood Tools. Uh, the roughing tool. Uh, with the CI2 square cutter. And I'm going to come in here and clean up this end. Because it's not really clean and straight. And this is a lot safer. Let me lower that tool wrist. Uh, I'd rather bung up one of these used up or used carbide cutters than that nice roughing tool. Okay. So now I need to decide what chuck jaws. That's going to not quite work in this chuck. So I think, let's see, I've got, I'm just looking around to see what I've got set up here. I've got a supernova set up with those. My easy chuck is over there. I could put two and three eighths in the easy chuck now that it's back from the cleaners. Let's do that. We'll set up the easy chuck. So it's in a, I've got it in a supernova right now. Pop this off, keep a little fresh air for a minute. My freshly cleaned up Easy Chuck, back from factory service. It's a nice day out here. Get my little calipers. Use the zoom ring feature. Just zip that set of jaws right down where I want it. Calipers are already set for that cool beans. Good to go there. So we'll use our calipers to make, and we'll use that same cutter. Um, one of the things I like about using the Easywood cutters, Easywood tools with their chuck jaws, 
is that when I cut this tannin, it's exactly the right length. So if I were to show you, say here in the overhead, I can use this cutter as my measuring device for the length of my tenon because it's perfect. So if I make the cut, the tenon just exactly as long as this cutter is uh, in dimension, I will be, I'll have about a sixteenth of an inch clearance on the bottom. See if I move down here, will that show? Not so much. Okay. Um, but I have clearance on the bottom of my chuck so my, I don't bottom out. So it works out perfect. All right. We're good there. We'll make our tenon down here. Then we'll put it into the chuck, and then we'll go ahead and go on from there. Back into the overhead. About to turn it on. Any questions along the way, gang? You know what? Well, holler. Shoot me a question in there. That's why I'm here. all the way over there. And I'd like to work in gently on this. That sounds just about right. You can also cut with the side of the cutter. Okay. Let's see how that's feeling. A little bit more to go. Okay, that's just about right on the money. Now I also need to put a little dovetail on there as usual. Again, I'll use the EasyWood tool. I'll use their detail tool. And it's a little tricky because of the space here. So we'll put our dovetail in here. Come at it from two angles. The key being that we have a nice flat shoulder right in here. Okay, so we've got a nice shoulder there. Our length looks good. Now way down in here, I have a little teeny bit of wood left over, which you can't quite see. That shouldn't be an issue because it'll be standing off, but I'm going to take a little bit more of that away just to be sure. And get right up in here close to the step drive. Just get rid of as much of that wood as possible. Okay, all right. Good deal. Let's change things around, get this into the chuck. Pretty piece of wood, the pattern uh, moves nicely. There's a little bit of, little bit of punkiness right in here. Um, I don't know how deep that's gonna run. We'll see what happens. Worst case scenario is I can always cut this back if I need to, if this just doesn't wanna cooperate. Once we have it in the chuck, we can chop this off and make it a little bit shorter um, if we have to. Hopefully we don't. All right. Take care of that. Swap out chucks. I'm looking forward. Today's a, it's a good Monday. I get, I, I'm getting the, the, uh, the yard work bug, the fever again, to start working on the, the yard and the plants. And some of you saw the post in the Spirecraft uh, wood and resin turning community on Facebook. I'm having all the trees here trimmed. Uh, professionally pruners are coming in and we've got one, two, three, four, four big um, pecan trees. And I'm actually got four dogwoods that are coming down too. 
Uh, and so if they're really pink inside, that'd be cool. And the dogwoods are about so big at the, at the base, so there'll be some interesting wood out of those as well. Uh, one, one big trunk section coming off of a pecan, and then a lot of limbs that are in the six inch range or so. Um, and like I said, in the, in the group, I said, hey, if you guys are interested, and I know a lot of you are, uh, I will cut that stuff up seal it on the ends it'll be green and uh, make a super great price on it and it'll get it shipped out to you um, because with the pecan it some people call it pecan crete or pecrete once it dries it's really hard so if you're interested in pecan uh getting some green pecan from south georgia uh, just you know contact spirocraft info at spirocraft contact spirocraft bradley at spirocraft.com uh, any of those and say, hey, you know, I'm interested in some of that. And you'll see the posts in social media, Facebook, Instagram, etc. cetera, um, when I've started making the wood available. And uh, say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm interested in some of that stuff too. And I'll, I'll come up with some price structure and whatnot. Uh, I'm not really trying to make, looking to make money on it. I just want something for my time. And then, of course, cover the shipping uh, and get people into some wood that you might not normally get. So, cool deal. All right. Boy, I hope I didn't make that too small. Right on the money. All right, just got to get it in there straight. So my, my end is actually touching just a little bit. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to make a quick change here. Go back because I'm not sitting as flush as I want. So before we get all fired up and carried away, I'm going to put the other chuck back on here. But I'm going to turn this piece around so that I can get to it a little bit easier. Always make sure that it's before you get totally committed to your project, I, was, I could see that it wasn't sitting in the chuck like I wanted it. Maybe I was talking too much and made the tent in too long. Maybe the little uh, tang of wood that's sticking out is just a little much. So we're gonna turn it around this way. And come in from the end and looking at this, I think I have, what happened is I have a crown, I have a little bit of a crown in the, in the very end, uh, right across the top here. It's actually got a little bit of a dome, so because when I went in, I went in at an angle. So we're going to, let's, let's clean that up. Make this just like we want it. So we'll cut the whole thing back just a little bit. Check that center, we're all good. And I'm gonna shot the end shot's probably the best for you. So that still runs pretty true. We're gonna take this back just a little bit more. I'm gonna check that length. Should be fine there. And you just can't quite see that. You can, you can see the top of it in the end camera there. Show you what I'm going to tip this down just a fuzz. Just so you can see that. Good morning, Mark Thompson. How are you, sir? Hope it's good out in California today. No, you're in Arizona, excuse me. I retract the California statement. So anyway, I've taken this down just as small as I can. And then I'll just take that last little nub off of there with a chisel. Okay, so there's a little teeny, teeny nub in there that will just pop off with a chisel and have that be all good. All right, so now we'll have a nice secure grip in here. Just a little teeny, teeny, teeny nub. Let's see if, I, if this will show. I'm kind of far away. Uh, let's see if this will show up in the overhead for you. Not so much, I bet I can make it show up in the end camera. Trying to get the right angle though. 
almost. You can almost, it may not be worth all the effort. But anyway, you see that little teeny nub right there? We're just gonna take that off with the chisel. Okay? Happen to have the chisel right here. And I saw the mallet earlier today. There it is. Uh, I'm gonna pop this to the overhead for a sec while I walk in front of the camera. All right, good deal. And we'll just chop that off of there. So the other thing, as I said in the in the uh, the description of today's uh, episode here, I want to dye this uh, the dye this, this ambrosia maple, or even if it doesn't have much ambrosia to it, this this maple with the swirls. It, it really looks nice when you dye it with the Chromacraft aniline dyes. And uh, so we get this guy turned into whatever it is. We're going to throw a little color on it. Because it really makes it, it can make a difference, you know, if you like color. If you don't like color, natural is a wonderful thing. If you like color, it can make something all colorful and bright, spring like. And by Ollie. The Chromacraft Aniline dies that Spidercraft carries will do the trick. All right, that's a hundred times better. And I am going to move this headstock over while I can. Get this centered up. And then I'll adjust that other camera. So one thing I want you to see is right here, the, the chuck jaws, they have, oh, three thirty seconds of an inch there so literally the perfect circle all right and I'm just gonna keep cramping that down anything short of the metal touching you couldn't see that I hit forgot to change cameras um, the jaws right there just a little gap in there okay so I have a nice perfect circle right there a super super grip and it's important because this piece being now this thing's what a foot long, 14 inches at the moment. Um, there's going to be a lot of flex, a lot of leverage out here on the end, right? Uh, so we want as good a grip as we can get, and that's why, as you can see again, I used as big a jaw, made as big a tenon as I could as I could possibly make for this piece of wood right here. This is still flat right here. I didn't want to waste any wood. I didn't care about that being flat as long as I had my tendon in my shoulder. So that was really important. Okay. All right. Now I see that the center I have here on the end, and I'm going to adjust this camera down here. And I think what I'm going to do while I'm doing these adjustments on this camera is I'm going to zoom it in closer so we can watch, watch the work on the cup being done. So we just keep adjusting that and we zoom in. There we go. Somewhere right about there. I can't get the new camera soon enough. Okay, that looks in focus still. Let's see what happens when we turn this thing, turn the speed down. All right, so that looks pretty good. Never mind my, my nails there, my fingernails. I need to go to the, the, the nail salon, right? So, all right, that looks pretty good. So what you can see here is my center is not centered anymore. And when I bring my live center up, I don't know if you can see that in the shadow there, it doesn't actually hit in the little hole that's there, right? So I just want to clean up this end anyway. It's not flat either. So we're going to come in here real gentle like and we're going to have to work with that here but we're going to make some some shape out here on the cup um, so that's why we're going to do this uh, first always make the cup first Still with a carbide tool just because it's convenient, it's handy, it's already set up for it. 
And you can hear the vibration from me being so far extended. And I want to get rid of that negative brake. Ah. Tools fly into the floor. Who's driving this place? I must have been doing resin lately. Everything's a negative rake around here. Tool rest is just a fuzz high. Why not use the center? Uh, I'm about to use the center, but art, but the center is not centered. We're going to put the center back here in a second. Put the hole for the center, so it was going to push the live center <coughs> off center. So we, <coughs> excuse the cough, we had to recenter that. If that makes sense, the center was not centered. Now the center is centered. Okay. So yeah, hopefully that made sense. Art, that little hole in the center was not in the center. So when I went to put was going to put the tailstock up, the live center would not have gone into that center hole, and it will push it off uh, off the center and give you trouble. Okay. So we're back between centers. We can play with this, clean it up. Uh, this area, again, right in here, let's see, if I show you here on the end camera, see this, this section here that's really white? It's looking pretty soft and punky. So it may not turn very well, that section right in there. So we'll see. And I'll pop you back up into the overhead there. And I can use any of the tools I want. I, you know, it doesn't really matter. I mean, if you got a spindle gouge and you want, you're good. You you like your spindle gouge. Just this spindle work. Um, use your spindle gouge. If you don't own a spindle gouge, you can use your bowl gouge. Uh, if you don't have conventional tools, you can use your carbide tools. Whatever you want to use will do the trick. My problem is usually finding the tools that I'm looking for in my treasure trove here. Okay, let's see what shape this guy's in. So I have a little uh, three eighths Carter and Son spindle gouge here. But it needs to go to the grinder real quick. It's got a real flat nose on it. So I'm going to jump over here real quick. Just as quick as I can. Lightning fast. And I don't have a camera over here. But as soon as the new cameras come in, that will free up these other older cameras to be overhead at the grinding station. And life will be oh so much better. And I'll be able to show you everything that goes on all the time. I don't know what I was doing with this last time. It sure was a mess. And uh, see, we're in overhead, so I, I used the um, the wood cut. True grind uh, sharpening jig and popped it in there real quick. 
All right, let's do a little trimming on this guy. That's hot. First, I'm going to establish the diam at the very top, and we'll leave it as much as we can get. And you can see how it's out of round here. Okay. And I'm going to turn that speed up. And work like, spindle work like this speed is your friend. So I'll take her up to about 2,000 right now. When I go inside the cup, I might slow it back down. And I don't have a cup shape in mind yet. You guys know how I roll. I just kind of get out here and start going and having fun. I'm just squaring this up again or truing it up. And let me switch it to the end camera so you can see how the tool's working as well. You can see, just cutting right down so you see the nice fresh edge. I just come in here right at the very tip. So what I like to do is establish the angle. Um, and again, I'm kind of far off to one side, but this is such a big piece. So I establish an angle up here, then I'll take the inside out, and we want to leave as much wood behind everything as we can for rigidity and strength, keep it from flexing so much. And just to show you, you know, you can do the exact same thing if you want to work, if you've got, if you're carbide tools, that's what you've got. Well, by golly, you can come right in here and do all the same thing with your carbide style tools. Okay. Doesn't matter what you want to use, they'll all get you there. So this softwood um, is definitely different and it's actually making a hump in the piece. So when I spin the piece and put my finger on here, you can kind of feel that, that funky spot. Although it leaves a little character to it, but you see the worm, uh, if you can, you can, I don't know, I'm not zoomed in close enough for you there. Let me see if you can see it better on any camera. No, not really. Um, this punky section, you know, it's, it's given a little bit of trouble. And the other thing about it, if, without stabilizing it, is that when we go to sand it, it will also sand a little bit differently. So that's the one thing about soft wood, the older wood, and, and when it gets a little bit of rod in it, a little bit of soft punkiness, it can start to give you those kind of uh, issues or problems that you don't really see right off. So what I'm doing is I'm just slowly working my way down and I'm going to leave, you know, maybe an inch and a half or so in here. And then we'll go in and hollow that out. That's not too bad. 
Okay, so. Now, realistically, if you have a steady rest system, this piece being 14 inches long, it would be very advantageous uh, from the flex standpoint and the vibration to use one. Uh, in this case, mine is next door buried somewhere, and I just didn't want to take the time to set it up, but it would take a lot of this flex that I'm going to have away, because it's a fairly long piece hanging out here. Get this out of the way. So if you've got one uh, for something this long, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a bad idea. If you had it, it definitely helps. It's not 100% necessary by any means, but it sure does help. Okay. Now, personally, just this is me, I'm going to use a little bowl gouge to go down in here and empty this guy out. It's just kind of my preference. I, I'm more comfortable, more used to it, if you will. Um, so let's pop you into the end camera. And we'll go ahead and follow this, this outer profile that we've made here. And we'll take the inside out of this. And you're going to hear a good bit of vibration. You could drill it with your drill bit and stuff like that and get a lot of this out of there if you wanted to. The more I push down the center axis, the less vibration I'll have. Again, if you have carbide style tools, by all means, you could do this with a carbide style tool. Okay. You know what else we could use? Uh, this will be fun. I haven't used it in a while. Is the woodcut tools and uh, uh, carbide cutter here? Okay. I'm not as proficient because I haven't practiced with it nearly as much. This is a round carbide cutter that has a bevel to it. It does like to work from the inside out, preferably. And also clean up that edge there. This has been a very popular tool. Uh, Spyrocraft started carrying the woodcut tools in uh, late November, December of last year and this little this is called the little the little wonder cup tool these have been very popular i keep reordering these matter of fact i'm going to order some more today And this gives you a really, really clean, fine cut. Uh, nice and smooth in there. I need to clean that up as well, that edge. I'm going to use a bowl gouge here. So like I say, there's no limit 
no, only to the number of tools. You don't feel like you have to use a certain tool. Okay. Now the vibration can be a little unnerving and if you don't like that you can go ahead and, and use a forstner bit and say drill a half inch hole down through here and save yourself a lot of work. But to me it's great practice as well. And that's my small bowl guts. I could also, you know, if I wanted to, uh, I could use a little larger tool. This one. See what shape this guy's in. Tool table over here. And we can also work from the center. You can kind of drill your way down in there. So that's a traditional, more standard looking bowl gouge. And I also have my little quarter inch bottom feeder. Uh, style tool that is one of my favorites as well. Now it's harder to work from the inside with this one because of the way the wings are. And the other thing, if I have one. Oh, let's do this. This is not negative, right? So this is a Easywood Tools uh, detail style tool, right? It's a pointed, sharp, pointy guy, and you can actually do the same kind of thing with this. So as you can see, what I'm trying to show you is that there's a lot of different ways to get there. Okay. And I guess, uh, you know, I'm really, I'm trying to make the point that you don't have to get super hung up on having the exact right tool. Is it always nice to have, you know, the exact right tool or whatever's right for the job? Well, yeah, of course. But we don't all have 50 tools to choose from. Yeah, so that my point being, you know, you can, with... Uh, if you think about it and, and, and a little practice or whatever and just think about your approach, you can utilize a lot of different tools to do the same thing. Is it necessarily the perfect tool always? No. Um, but then again, what is the perfect tool? It all depends on what's working that day. Uh, oftentimes you'll see me change tools. Today I'm changing tools just to show you that you can do this with a lot of different tools. A lot of times though I might change tools because one profile just isn't working for me. I'm, just, I'm not happy. The wood's fighting me or whatever. So don't be afraid to try different uh, tools in your approach. Okay? All right, let's get back in here. Keep right on charging. I kind of like working with this little pointy guy. Would I ever put wood hardener on a piece like that? Uh, yeah, this piece, uh, if I hadn't just grabbed it out of the shed here this morning, first thing, um, this would have been nice uh, to stabilize. And then it would be kind of become more of a, a hybrid resin piece. But yeah, you can certainly stabilize this guy um, and help with that, uh, that punkiness that's that right in there. For sure, Art. Where you run into trouble here, with this tool, see this this heel here? That kind of gets in your way. And if you look at my smaller one here, it voids the warranty, but I have ground that heel away. Okay? Now that's got a negative rate cutter on it, but that grinding that heel away on there gives me more clearance. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to raise this up, smaller tool, so that the bottom of a tool like this doesn't drag, okay? As you get down into smaller and smaller, it'll, that bottom will want to drag.
And so by having relieved it, it doesn't it doesn't touch. Okay? A lot of ways to get there. And I'm just having fun today. What's nice about this uh, using this is I can cut with the tip and I can also cut with the sides here coming right down here and this is a nice fresh cutter so I'm getting a nice clean cut with it Now because it's so pointed, it can be a little hard to drive, okay? So I switched back over to the bowl gouge and now you see that I have to rotate the tool angle. So my tool is now over here, and whereas before with the carbide tool I could just come down the side. So there's everything has its little nuances. Uh, that you have to work with and that's right up on the edge here don't do that bud so in this case I like my little bottom feeder because now for the very bottom in here Even though it's not super sharp, I can come right across the bottom there and clean that guy right up. That tool could stand a trip to the grinder. Or let's do this. So I talk about them often. Um, we can also take our little diamond card. I got one handy like right here. And let's just freshen this edge up on this tool and see if it makes a difference. It's just a little a little grabby so I'll just take this and this is the one a 180 card because just the one that was close hopefully my mask isn't in the way yeah but and we're just gonna freshen up that edge without having to go over to the grinder and and really get uh, crazy with this thing. Let's see if that makes a difference for us. Just a little teeny touch like that. Let's see if we get a little bit better cut here. Definitely just a little touch. Made for a much nicer cut. And we're about an inch and a half or so down in there. We're right on down in there. And you can see a nice cut. Um, again, I can use, 
I can come in with my little wonder cup tool in the carbide. You use your card. Yeah, they're ha they're super handy when you like I say you don't want to run to the grinder and all that. Um, it makes a it really helps. This is a little wonder cup tool again. This doesn't get, have anything to get in the way. I can't see down in there, but I can feel it. And that does a real nice job down inside there. Okay. I, I buggered up the end there when I cut the uh, bowl gouge tip, so we're just going to fix that up. Nobody knows how long it was when you started. more different right there. Got to be a little more aggressive taking it out of there. So we'll just cut it back some more. Okay, and that's that right there. That's that soft punky wood. It's just trying to be difficult. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. Because we're gonna take a lot of this away, we're gonna sand this right now real quick while it's in this, at this stage. I'll grab a little sandpaper coming because once we take away the shaft in here, it'll be much harder to sand um, because of the flex and all that. So we're gonna sand the inside of this um, right now. And I've got sandpaper right back here in my handy dandy Fresh from Colorado sandpaper bin. A little bit of 120 in here ought to do the trick. 120, 220. Pop you in the end there. We'll just clean that up. I don't like to sand out here in the studio because of the dust and all the cameras. It's one of the reasons you'll like, you virtually don't see me sand around here uh, to speak of. Just because of getting the stuff in the electronics. And here's the piece of worn out 220. And the other thing, because I know that I'm going to dye this and then put lacquer on it, I don't worry about going past 220 because I'll sand the lacquer itself and that will make my finish nice and smooth and shiny. Okay. All right, so our inside is good to go. I mean, it's got worm holes in it and everything else, but that's all nice and smooth and ready for finish. So... Here's where I wish I could find my other live center because I could put a rubber chucky in here or the cone, but I could not find it this morning to save my life. And I'm going to take a quick look somewhere one more time, but I don't think I'm going to come up with what I'm looking for. Maybe I'll be lucky. But I'm not feeling it. I'm not, I'm not feeling it, you know.
Which is quite aggravating. Okay. Well, what we're going to do is we're just going to take a little piece of foam that I had. Just so we don't beat it up in here. Let's we'll drop that foam in there. Get a bull nose center handy. And we're just going to tighten this up. And I don't want to put too much pressure on it. Because um, the more I push here, the more it's going to want to bow the piece out. It's just to steady it up. Okay? Now let's see what happens here. We can take a bunch of this away and then come back and work that. And we may or not may or may not make it this long. Okay. And so spindle roughing gouge is the optimum tool. If you don't have one, Say you're, you've been started out as a bowl turner and you just want to use your bowl gouge, right? Breaking conventions, take your half inch, five eighths bowl gouge, and we can, we can work this down with that as well. Is it optimum? No, it's not the optimum tool, but it will do the trick if necessary. And I'll put you in the overhead now. Now I think of this, you know, as roughing as, as I go. Again, if you don't have a, the, you know, another a tool, a roughing gouge, well, then that would work. If you do have your roughing gouge, it definitely works better, but you may not have one. Okay. So it helps, it really helps to learn to work with what you've got. Pretty piece of wood here, pretty piece of wood. All right. I'm going to move on down here. Michael, how are things in the Northwest? I hope you're doing well, sir. I'm out here making a mess and having a ball. Beautiful spring day in Georgia. Mowing through some maple. So I don't usually go to the left because of my electronics over here and I'm right handed. I love the holes in this, the wormholes. Yes, I do.
So we can do a lot of different things and we can do some detail up in here. We can leave detail here. This is where you get to start to be creative if, if the mood is striking you to, to do such. If you want if you want to make little different decorative areas on your piece, right? You know, I'm just kind of playing around here. Nothing says you can't do whatever comes to you. I woke up to snow on the ground. You're not supposed to have snow, are you, Mike? You're supposed to be on the coast where it's warm, tempid. All that good stuff. So I keep looking at my profile up here as I work my way through, okay? So, you know, you just do whatever comes to you. Oh, I keep forgetting to change tools here. So let's say you have carbide tools and you don't have traditional tools. Make sure it's really important now that you get centered because if you get below, if it, and the tool goes below, um, with this it will catch, grab, and break your piece. Okay, so make sure you're well centered up. All right. And you can use your carbide style tools just as easily. Okay, I've got a little spot right up in here. I should take care of that right now before I get any further. And also, I didn't grab one yet. I can use a radius. It's going to be a negative rate cutter today. But I can use a radius square style tool. I'll pop you here. Get it where we can stay in focus. So that's got a little radius on the end. Again, it's negative rate just from my last time I was doing resin. But that will allow you, if you're in your carbide tools, to um, clean up your finish, smooth things right out. Without having the round style cutter. Okay? When I use these, I think of uh, kind of like sanding with the with the cutter. Keep these just a, a nice and sharp, fresh one. Okay, and you can clean that right up.
raise that tool rest back up just a fuzz. So what you may not have noticed there is this is not the spindle gouge, this is a little bowl gouge. Again, just going through the different tools with a little patience. You can do whatever you want to. Now we start to get flex here, and that's where it gets tough because when it flexes, then you don't get a, a nice even cut. Okay, and you can decide just how far you want to go with all of that. Okay. little hump right in there how am I doing on time here 12 19 okay so let's see here let's get rid of some more of this It's great practice for tool control, even if you end up messing one of these up. Great tool control practice. Okay. Now I'm going to come in here and with that uh, roughing gouge and, and move a little more material real quick, just because of the times. I want to get the I want to get the die out. I, wanna, I don't want to run out of time for the die. This is too much like fun. Let's see, what are we going to do up here? Kind of got to start thinking about our base a little bit. Come down here, I'm thinking, well, let's see. I think I'll take a parting tool. This is how what I like to do. And just give myself some place, make myself a reference. I'm gonna leave some wood back there. 
This, so this kind of gives me somewhere visually to work to. All right, I've got a point here now. Uh, my eye can kind of work back and forth between here and there. Plus, I got myself away from uh, away from the chuck quite so much. Okay, so it's getting thin and uh, I've got holes. This gouge is pretty sharp, but I start to feel a little resistance, and so I have to be careful um, that I don't push too hard on the tool and start to flex, flex the wood. Okay. So we can switch gears, switch tools. That little line right there, I'm not sure if that's a bug line. Yeah, that's a bug hole, okay? So, the bug holes make it more susceptible to breaking, obviously. I wish I was left-handed better. It never hurts to practice with your left hand. I just think at it. So we'll make that nice and scary right there. Okay. Nice and scary. And then for fun. We'll give it another little something here. All right, we'll clean all this up. We'll make this guy just pseudo busy, just kind of busy, not super busy, just pseudo busy. And again, if you're of the carbide tool world, nothing wrong with that. Wherever I put mine, where did I put that other one? All the way over here. 
Carbide's what you're running. Nothing wrong with that. You may have to sand a little more, especially on the softwood. It tends to lift up the fibers a little bit more with the carbide, um, especially when you got wormholes and everything else in here. Okay, but it doesn't mean you can't can't get there, can't do what you need to do or want to do. And again, you may may not think it, but even though I'm on this little small stuff, I'm actually you see my whole body is rotating. As I make that really small there, okay. This is such great tool control practice. It's just fantastic. All right, I'll pop you back into the overhead. Okay, so that's, that's looking pretty cool. I'm going to raise my tool wrist up just a fuzz. That's my time. 12.20. Okay, cool beans. I think we'll be right about on time with this. Pick that cut up there where I had a little line. All right, this is one funky looking goblet. So I've got a wormhole right there, so I need to be careful. It's not real big, and it's got the wormhole right in it. But I want to clean this profile up here, so that's where I'm going to work a little bit. Slow down my cut, work on the profile. I'm looking at the opposite edge of the piece. Okay. Let's give it one more weird little shape here. Why? Just because. Switch back to a spindle gouge.
Nice, clean, crisp little transition there. So, you know, it's kind of, what I've done is kind of strange, you know, this, this profile doesn't match that one at all, it kind of matches that one, so one could argue that this should be rounded over more, or, or drop in more, um, you know, it's your oyster, do with it what you, as you see fit. I'm going to hit this spindle gouge real quick with the diamond card. Just real quick. Just down here. Getting just a little bit of resistance and, and I'm going to get rid of that. I know you can't see, but I'll be back in just a second. And see, that makes all the difference in the world. Hopefully my head's not in the way. Yeah, just that little bit of freshening up there allows me to lighten up the cut pressure. get a nice clean cut. Okay, so that's about as weird as you can get. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that, weird as it is, just because I like weird. I don't have a problem with weird. As far as I'm concerned, weird is fun. Uh, let's see, got a little, uh, that's just the bugs. We're going to leave that there. Let's do a little quick sanding on this, and we're going to leave it right here and color it right here. Um, so, a little quick sanding. Put it in reverse for this. This window, the fan will blow it away. I'm going to turn it down a little bit. Again, I'm not going to spend an inordinate amount of time sanding on it. Just a quick 180 and 220. You have to be careful, especially with that soft section of wood, because you can sand it out around.
This, if you push on it very hard when you're sanding, uh, you can sand it out around. I'm going to pop you in the overhead. Again, I hate, you know, much sanding because of all the cameras and the computers in here. Okay, now there's some tool marks right in there. I could spend more time there. Um, but the clock is ticking, 12.38. See if I can find a fresher piece of 220 for this. So the question is, what color? What color should we dye this? We've got some light whites. We've got some, some brown ambrosias to it. Okay. I'm open to suggestions. There's not a bad choice when it comes to color. Well, I mean, it's everybody's own opinion, obviously. This section right in here was the roughest. Didn't want to cut real clean. You can see how easy that is to flex, so you know, be careful with it. Anything except green, absolutely, Lan. Good call. Because we all know what happens to green out here with Bradley. It turns into the back wall. Okay, cool beans. Bump back up here. So we're gonna, you know, we're gonna call that uh, sanded for for all intent and purpose for what we're doing. Uh, see if my little board will fit in here. It'll fit well enough to keep it off my lathe. Okay. Uh, all right. Anything but Greenland says. I'm going to pop you in the overhead there again real quick while I walk over to the cabinet and get some dye. And a little cup. Let's see, the first color that came into my hand was cobalt blue. Then there's some green. We'll stay away from that. Blood red. What else is close by here? Black. Might avoid that for now. Yellow. I'm looking to see. Okay, no other comments on color uh, suggestions at the moment. So I see some darkness in it. 
Um, looking at it, I'm, I'm over here on the other side, so the yellow is going to make the brown, just kind of, the darker is kind of brown. I'm going to make an executive decision and go with cobalt blue. Cobalt blue is going to be my choice. Art says red. Well, thanks for chiming in, Art, but I've already got the blue out. Always wear gloves when you work with this. Just a little bit. Don't need much in my little cup. <laughs> my wife Bridget's watching. Hey, Bridget. She says, that's gorgeous. Pick a color I like. Um, well, I'm, I'm certain you like cobalt blue, honey. Because that's what we're getting. All right, so here we go. And when we dye this, we want to make sure we get keep the whole thing wet as we go the whole time. Okay, now I didn't put any sealer on this. And it'll be interesting to see how what pops and what doesn't. And what I'm hoping is that this will dry quick enough before noon... And I'll spray a little lacquer on it, and it'll make these colors start to pop. Okay. Because if you stop now and answer the phone, then you come back, well, you end up with two coats. Now, if you want two coats on here, like I'm looking at it, I'm thinking maybe or not. And I need to do the inside, so I'm going to take my tailstock away, take my foam out, and I'll change cameras for you here. You can see this guy, how flexible it is. And I'll go to the end camera. And here's another interesting thing for you. Oh, you weren't seeing the colors. I'm sorry. Um, I was doing it overhead. There's the there's the flex that I was talking about when I took it took it off of there and I took the tailstock away and now I'll go to the end and again you can see just how flexible she is um, but what I was going to say is you can see the dye bleeding through the pores in the cell structure of the wood from the inside okay. So there's a little spot that was missed right there. I have to hit that again. Make sure everything on the inside is covered up. And I'm going to go down through here. I'm going to bring my tailstock back up and kind of hold this guy. If I can, no, I can't. Um, I'm going to paint one more coat down through here real quick. It will lighten up it when it as it dries. Now I've got a fan blowing directly on me and the piece of wood. So hopefully it'll dry pretty quick. And it will. And then I will spray a shot of my ever favorite lacquer on it. Okay, so again, this is the Chromacraft aniline dye that we carry at Spirocraft and I'll use Chromacraft lacquer and we'll just set that off there so you can see I mean it, it's it looks it looks dark because that of course it is a cobalt which is a pretty a pretty dark um, but when this gets shiny and when a good light hits it you'll be amazed at what pops out of here so I'm going to actually let this spin just a second. 
And that'll help get that dye to dry. And I can't go too fast though. I could pull the Jimmy Clues and light it on fire and burn the alcohol off and it'd be dry right now. I did that out at the woodworking shows one time. I'm just checking the time here. 12.47. Uh, I lit it on fire at one of the shows. I dyed up a piece and I had big flames come off the lathe. It was cool. It was really fun. Uh, so let me pop you in overhead while I walk over here and get some lacquer. There we go. So while we're waiting for that to dry, does anybody uh, that's in the audience today have any kind of questions real quick? Or, you know, here we got 10 minutes or so. Sorry for the gurgle there, I needed something cold and wet. So I'm just shaking up. Art says, don't forget to get some on the chuck. But I just got it back from Easywood and it's all nice and clean. Doug Dixon, the sales manager from Easywood, he's not in here today, I don't think. Um, he would shoot me if I got dye on the chuck right off. Uh, Joe said, uh, da, 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 what was it? I saw Joe, red and violet. Um, those would be cool colors, Joe. Again, so just, you know, it was a chunk of wood from... I don't know, I've had this maple forever. So what this is, when I, when I cut my big bowl blanks, uh, this probably came out of where, when I cut for the pith and I lay out, pith is in the center and I lay out my big bowl blanks on either side. And then there's that section above and below the pith. Then I cut those off and I square them up, relatively speaking, and, and, and dry them up. Uh, so Mike says, if, Michael, Mike, if you're blending colors, do you want one color to dry before using the second? Mike, it depends on the look that you're after. Uh, if you want them to actually be a gradient, then no, you want them wet on wet and they'll blend together. Um, if you're putting one over the other, let it dry so that it doesn't affect the other. Um, but you'll need to always put your lighter colors on first and your darker colors over. If you don't, you, um, you won't see your lighter colors on top of the darker colors. So if you're gonna have, you know, uh, multicolor, if you will, either don't color the whole thing, which is one thing you can do. So like, let's say I had wanted this to be cobalt blue and yellow, would have been really cool, right? I would have kind of splattered, splashed the cobalt blue on and left spaces that had no dye whatsoever. And then I would have come back over, or I could have come back over with the yellow, and I would have gotten yellow where there was no blue. I would have had the blue, and if I didn't cover all the blue with the yellow, um, I would have spots of green. If I covered the entire blue with the yellow, I would have more of a green when I combine the colors. They're going to combine to whatever the color wheel is going to mix for you. So if you can have three colors from two, uh, if you do that, if you put one color on and don't hit everything, and then put another, like say in this case the yellow, on the spots that had no color, that'll be yellow. And then wherever the yellow and the blue combine, you'll get green. So you'll get three, you'll get three colors, at least three colors. Um, so it depends on the look you want. Um, because what's going to happen also if the first one is wet, it's going to uh, bleed up under your brush. And then as you, every time you put the brush in your other, your secondary color, you're going to be altering that color. Okay? If that makes any sense. I hope that does. All right, so this guy probably is not 100% dry. It still feels a little cool. And I don't have my watch on, but it says 1252. So I'm going to go ahead and spray this, and I'm going to turn off the fan so it doesn't... Actually, I'm just going to turn the fan down. And I'm going to pop you into the overhead. Now, here's the, here's the part. The, uh, 
the dye gets lighter as it dries, and this isn't really dry yet, but we're gonna we're gonna go with it. Um, but then the finish, when we put the clear finish on, sometimes we'll often make it darker. All right, and that's why if you're playing with colors like this, I would always recommend take a scrap piece of the same wood and dye it first, then put your finish on and see if it's the color you're looking for and the intensity you're looking for. It might be too dark and you want to go ahead and thin, reduce your, your dye with, uh, in this case, alcohol, um, so it is not so saturated. Just depends on what it does. So if you'll put the finish on before you actually do your finished piece, do a scrap piece, a sample piece with the colors and then even different uh, strength, ratio strengths, put the colors on and then put your lacquer your, or your, whatever your finish is, put that on top. Then you'll know what you're going to get for the most part on your workpiece. Okay. All right. Let's see what we get here. She's not dry, but we're almost out of time. So overhead. Now this is going to suck up the, the, the lacquer like crazy because it's not been sealed at all. And that's against that black, so you really can't see it. I need something white under here. I have just a thing. Now this is going to throw off the color balance, the white balance on the camera. Um, but I just kind of get that sometimes. So it looked, I know it looks awful dark. And especially when the, with the white see what it looks like on on the big monitor there and um, the other thing I can let me take this out of the way because we're gonna spray the inside now what would be fun with a piece like this is you could come back with a darker color like a black highlight or low light if you will I know you <coughs> You can't see in there because it's so dark. It's a beautiful piece of wood. And this, this, a blue like this, a dark color, takes a lot of light. You put this out in the sunlight or somewhere like on a shelf on display with a lot of light on it, and you'll really see the colors. I have a piece that, that went to the Sofa Show in Chicago, and it's, it's a blue like this. It's called Blue Velvet, and it's got to be uh, in a lot of light. It's, it's black and blue, basically. It's blue with black uh, swirls on it. And the only, about the only other thing I could do for this would be to get it to really zoom in uh, the overhead camera. But it's so small that you have to be like up on this in person almost to see. Now you could also, you could do a lot of things. You could sand back through here if you dare um, and not to not break it. <coughs> Got to have the ventilation in here pretty soon. Um, you could sand back through it in places and then dye it again and you won't get so much color uh, com combination, but you will get some. So lots of different things. Uh, again, this went, this is fairly dark, but when I get it, I, I'll, once I get enough coats of lacquer on it, and I'll take a picture of it um, with some really bright light on it, like out in, um, it's not super sunny today at all now. Uh, direct sunlight will really make these things pop or a, a real good stock, strong light. Um, a dark color, you'll still see all these grains that are down in here. Okay. Again, the cobalt was fairly strong uh, in this case, but down in the bottom here where you can't really see, you can see it's pretty, it's pretty neat. All right. But so that was a fun little piece. And again, it's a weird shape. Pop you in the overhead, I, you know, there's definitely, it's, it's a strange, strange shape about it. Um, but hey, it was fun. It was great tool practice. Uh, something to put on the shelf and then admire as a decorative piece, because it was fun. It was interesting, build your skill set. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful project. Wow. If you're selling art and craft shows, you can do stuff like this. And if I wasn't talking, you could do it in a whole lot less time. And, and you sell that 40, 50 bucks easy all day long. Um, this would also do well with the blue that because of the darkness, we could add some uh, silver chroma gilt or some gold chroma gilt to it. Uh, we could highlight it with some, some of the, those. And that would really be uh, sharp looking, make a nice, beautiful pop to it. 
So as I think about the, the Egyptian gold chroma gilt on here would be just fantastic as a highlight. Um, cool thing to do, uh, especially if I had maybe made a hard line somewhere in the piece where we could stop it, like say from the base down, we could color the whole base uh, Egyptian gold. Um, that would be pretty cool. I may do that. When this lacquer dries, I might just throw some Egyptian gold on it and take a picture for you guys. Uh, so it looks like it's just about my time to give up and go have lunch. It's the holiday and Bridget's off, so we're going to go have lunch together here in a few minutes, uh, which is always nice. I appreciate everybody coming out and uh, coming back on a Monday with me. I'm glad to be back. I don't foresee being out of town on a Monday anytime soon again. I hope to be here for a while. My winter has been a little crazy with my travel schedule, but um, I, th I think I'm around. I mean, I'm, I'm gone. I'm gone shopping tomorrow. I've got, I've got, I've got a lot of stuff coming up. Uh, good fun things uh, with Spirecraft. Working, working hard on Spirecraft. You may not see it right now, but there's a lot of stuff coming. Uh, so anyway, look forward to next Monday. I've got a couple projects in mind if I just get my tail and gear ahead of time far enough uh, to bring you some new things out here. Uh, it's just, as Calvin and Hobbes said, the days are just packed. So thank you, everybody. Have a great week. Uh, enjoy the rest of your holiday day today. I will see you next week, uh, Thursday night. I should be here. Uh, try and jump out here for the Monday Methods Wooden Resin Group. If you're not a member of the Monday Methods Wooden Resin Group, Firecraft Group, uh, find that on Facebook, Firecraft Wooden Resin uh, Turning Community. Come in and get a, be a member. We do a live uh, Google Meet conference or meeting on Thursday nights. For super, super casual. Uh, so, you know, we, we talk back and forth. It's just like doing a Zoom meeting. It's Google Meet. I'd uh, love to have you. Um, I'm joining in. We have a great time, and I'm out here in, in the studio so we can talk about whatever um, we do. Hopefully, it's something like what we did today. Okay, gang, thank you, everybody. Um, have a great day. I'm going to leave you in the overhead and head for the control room. See you all now. Overhead. Pretty blue piece. Crooked paper towel. Cinderella story comes to Augusta, which is coming up. <laughs> Good day, everybody.